Ho, ho, ho. Hi, everyone. Pablo here from Unique Japan. How are you? It's uh, December 10th, uh, 2015. Kind of in my Christmas spirit here with my Santa hat on. I hope you're all well. Um, I have a sword here at my home in, uh, in the UK. It's a beautiful wakizashi that I'd like to introduce to you today. The swordsmith is Mitsudaijo Miyoshi Nagamichi, a very famous smith from the 17th century. And uh, it really is my pleasure to, uh, to showcase some of the special uh, features about this smith and also the sword and the koshidai. So without further ado, let's take a look. Now, Nagamichi was known for making uh, stout, strong, sturdy swords. And the sword just feels that way when you hold it. Um, it's a wakizashi. The nagasai is 45.8 centimeters. Uh, that's the cutting edge, of course, right? That's how we always measure from the, from the cutting edge to the tip, 45.8 centimeters. And the sori is 1.0 centimeters. So a kind of shallow sori or curvature is known, you know, in that sort of Kambun era. Uh, you know, the sword, like I said, around 1661 it was made. So typical of, uh, of the era uh, and typical of, uh, of Nagamichi, the way that he made swords, strong, sturdy, stout. Okay, so, you know, just looking at it, it's really pretty, a pretty blade, okay? And I'll get to the, the nakago here. You can see that the sword is in Shirasaya. It also has a koshidai as well. So without further ado, let's take a look at oh, lovely habaki, by the way. Here's the habaki, silver with uh, a copper interior. Looks Edo period. Wonderful design, lovely silver habaki. Okay, so here is the signature. So, Mitsu, Mitsu province, Mitsu province, Daijo Miyoshi Naga Michi. Naga, of course, means long, and Michi is road or path, long path, Miyoshi. Actually, his, his family name is Miyoshi. He was, he, he was born Miyoshi Toshido. Uh, and originally, he signed his swords uh, Michi Naga. So Michi Naga was his original signature. But then he got his, his title in, what was it, 1660, 16, not 1660, 1659. And, uh, and when he got his title, he changed his name from uh, Michi Naga to Naga Michi. Clever. Very clever. All right. So here is now the the body is just so tight, you know, koi tame hara, and a beautiful gunome midare. Gunome, of course, sort of semicircular lines, but you can see it's not it's more wavy. It's almost bordering on notare. The the hemon, and look at that beautiful like just a beautiful laser beam. Nice consistency in the hemon all the way through. Nice and wide, quite far away from the hasaki, right? Very way, far away from the from the blade's edge. I'm a little teapot, short and stout. <laughs> yeah, just a little firecracker. This sword wide you can see you can you can really tell right see how how wide the sword is the uh, the motohaba is 3.2 centimeters that's the distance between the you know the, the the edge of the blade to the back to the mune right here that's called the motohaba very key measurement in japanese swords of course if it was polished several times then the blade naturally gets um more narrow uh and uh you know, this sh sword shows that uh, it may have been used, but not very often, if, if so, and certainly not polished uh, to a degree where it, it, 
you know, it hurt the blade. It just looks like it probably has never been used um, in combat because uh, it has its, it still has its full width to it. It's just a gorgeous piece. Let's take a look at the the other side. Now, Nagamichi was ranked Saijo Owazamono. So that's the cutting test. Right? So cutting test, Saijo Owazamono is the highest level, one of 12 smiths that achieved Grandmaster title for cutting ability. So there's a lot of swords by Nagamichi that have achieved have achieved, um, you know, cutting tests where they, you know, getting, cutting two bodies, three bodies, and, you know, severing at one time. Uh, it's just, you know, truly a fabulous maker of, of swords. You can see a little cayenne slightly, how the, how the blade, let's take a look. See how the, a little bit of flame going on at the end of the, of the, the boshi. The boshi is the, the hamon inside the kisaki. Yeah, it's very well done. Just healthy, you know. There's nothing wrong with the with the body. It's just clean and, and just well preserved. There's the back of the blade as well. A real joy to see swordsmiths work like this. He's ranked uh, Joe Saku uh, by Fujishiro, which means a superior swordsmith. Right. So. Yeah, just a just a great little piece in in general. So one interesting thing about Nagamichi, why he was perhaps so well regarded in his in his uh, in his work, I found this article by the Japanese Historic Sword Society of Canada. Uh, that went through the different uh, lamination techniques uh, that different swordsmiths used. You know, remember a Japanese sword is not just one hunk of steel, right? It's folded steel and then they have different laminations. The core of a Japanese sword is generally made of shingami or lower carbon steel and the edge is high carbon steel, right? So the high carbon, remember, high carbon allows the steel to get harder. If it's harder, it can get sharper. But if, of course, if you have too much uh, high carbon steel around the blade, it will get brittle and risk uh, breakage. So swordsmiths routinely uh, uh, experimented with different lamination techniques, fusing them together. And Nagamichi, according to this, this is a Holly, a Holly article. It was featured in the Japanese Sword Society of Canada, but the article originally was um, was produced by William Holly. In the, in the 1900s, and he isolated one work of Nagamichi, Let's see number 28, which is up here. So take a look. So this is a, uh, you can see right here, that's the hot, the, the dark part is the high carbon steel, and the different, and it looks like he put like a kind of a hard, higher carbon steel right in the center, uh, and with lower carbon steel around it, and and other lamination techniques to, to support the blade. And his, his words here is, by Nagamichi would represent a lot of extra work <laughs> and perhaps additional stiffness, but otherwise the core of the steel does not seem justified. That was his, um, that was his remarks, but um, regardless, the results prove that his sharpness was uh, unparalleled, one of the 12 uh, best uh, Smiths in the Shinto era for for sharpening for sharp swords. Kotetsu and, and Tadayoshi, of course, uh, you know, first generation Tadayoshi were among the um, the other swordsmiths that also had Saijo Owazumono. In fact, uh, Miyoshi Nagamichi was known as the Aizu Aizu Province, which where he he moved to uh, the Aizu uh, Kotetsu. So kind of paying tribute to Kotetsu. Actually, here's a map of Japan during the Edo period. So originally, his dad, Masanaga, and him, uh, not him, he was uh, he was born in, in uh, Iwashiro province, but they originally were 
uh, he his family comes from from here in uh, Io province of Ehime, and they traveled um, way up here to Iwashiro, and that is where Nagamichi was born in 1633, and uh, like I say, got his uh, his title in 1659, and he died in, in 1685, uh, age 53 or so. Uh, for those of you, this is the old, of course, the old provinces of Japan before they before the Meiji period where they have the modern day prefectures. But this whole area here, for those interested, is, uh, is Fukushima. So Aizu is on the west side of Iwash Iwashiro, and, uh, but this is really where the, uh, the tsunami hit around this area. Uh, but uh, anyway, this is where he, he grew up. He was retained by, by Daimyo Kato Yoshiake, the family Kato Yoshiake. And uh, so a lot of these great swordsmiths were retained, right? And so this Kato Yoshiaki was, well, he fought apparently with um, Tokugawa Iyasu and was rewarded quite handsomely uh, in his uh, kingdom. Tokubetsu Hozon. The sword has Tokubetsu Hozon papers, a sword especially worthy of preservation, Ishaku Nanasun. Or Gosun Ichibu, 45.8. All right, so here's that's the uh, Tokubetsu Hozon from the MBTHK paper. And uh, I mentioned earlier that uh, Nagamichi was ranked as Josaku by, um, by Fujishiro. And I am delighted to say that this sword also has a certificate from, from Matsuo Fujishiro. And this certificate was made in 2000 was produced in 2001. What I like about this certificate is that, you know, Matsuo Fujishiro was a master polisher and, uh, and became a, um, a living national treasure in 1996, I believe. Yes, 1996, my notes say. Eh? Uh, and this uh, certificate was done in 2001. So uh, while he was a living national treasure, he looked at this sword and, uh, and granted it a Kanteisho certificate as a genuine work of Miyoshi Nagamichi. So Mutsu, Mutsu province, Daijo is title, Daijo, and Miyoshi, Miyoshi Nagamichi. Some interesting information about the sword as well. So sometimes the downfall of the MBTHK papers, in my opinion, is that they don't put information about the actual blade, like which kind of hamon it is, or kogitame, or... Uh, or anything about the jihada. It's just simply a, a, you know, a trusted certificate, but more so on the on the genuineness of the of the signature and who they believe the sword is made by. If it doesn't have a signature, right? But then, but with um, uh, Fujishiro certificates, there's a little bit of information. So this is Kogitame. They're talking about the the uh, the jihada. So nice tight, uh, you know, Kogitame. Uh, or Koita Mitsumu, and this is also Honzukuri, so the sort of traditional uh, shape. And then you can hear, so Gunome, Gunome is the, 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 is the, uh, the Hamon Gunome Midare. Okay, so just a lovely, great uh, certificate. I think it looks really pretty and comes with this sword as well. Even had the original envelope that it came in. So, put that away. Now, we will place the sword. As you can see, it does come in its own shirasaya. We're going to place the sword inside its koshirai. So, let me do that for you right now. Always take your time when you're, when you're putting the sword in its koshirai. Very important. Because the sword has a... Um, a kozuka, I have to make sure that this habaki, you see how the habaki is curved here? I have to make sure that this habaki is on, is put on properly because you want to have that curved side on the left side of the blade when, uh, when it's mounted so that the kozuka could technically pass through the uh, tsuba. That's why the tsuba has, of course, the, the holes on each side, one for the kogai and one for the kozuka. They're both kind of bumped here, but normally this is this side here, the left side, is, um, is for the Kozuka and this is for the Kogai. Okay. 
actually. This is uh, this is signed. This uh, this tuba. I guess I'm not gonna be able to see that. This is a Shoami uh, tuba, and it's signed by Chodoku. Shoami and then Chodoku. So Shoami here and Chodoku. So beautiful piece. Nice to see a signed tuba. Good. Just a couple extra habakis here at the bottom. And nicely tight as well. So okay. So I put the kosher eye together. So a nice rounded kosher eye. This this uh, scabbard is from the Edo period. Um, nice rounded back. This is a good telltale sign that this sword was part of a daisho because it's rounded on the, on the, at the end of the scabbard. Uh, and let's take a look while the blade is inside. Some of the goodies here. So there's a view of the, of the design. This could be, could be clouds, I guess, clouds in the sky. Some, and it looks like a bamboo grove at the bottom. And for those that have been to Unique Japan's website, you see that my wife, Donna Kane, she specializes in Ikebana, an Ikebana artist. And uh, I thought this was very pretty. I showed it to her this morning. This is an Ikebana arrangement here on the, on the, on the cashier. Oh, there's the basket. Close here. Looks like I'm... Okay, there's the basket. And just one beautiful branch. Oh, yeah, there's a little, and there's a, a bird flying in the distance. So lovely, lovely kashida. This uh, an ikebana arrangement is really a reminder to stay in the moment. And you know that a lot of uh, samurai before they went into battle uh, exercised their ikebana skills to prepare them for war and to get them thinking about the moment. So shakugo, shaku, shakudo, and nanako. You can see the little small dots here. Always a nice, a beautiful common theme here for uh, the. That's the shisa lines protecting the the blade. You can see that the uh, the uh, the samikawa is uh, rather rather aged. So this looks like Edo period samikawa to me. The ray skin. So both sides of the of the silk have uh, shisa lions. Very well, very well done. And that theme of flowers uh, continues on the on the fuchi. Yeah. So it's just a really classy sword. And like I said, there's even a a uh, a kozuka slipping through. And the kozuka has a cricket, looks like, or beetles along with chrysanthemums on there as well. So The utility knife for the samurai, or I like to call it the Swiss army knife <laughs> of the Edo, of the Edo period. Okay, so now the actual koshirai itself, the actual saya rather, nice and dark inside. I feel like this is Edo period, Edo period piece. So, you know, 1800s. Sorry. All right. Very good. So all in all, it's just a very, uh, just a very beautiful sword. Like I say, very strong. Very, uh, just a very, it's a classic sword from Miyoshi uh, Nagamuchi that I think will, um, will, be a great sword for anybody who has a, an experienced collection, or for those looking for a first sword. My first sword was a, was a wakizashi, and this sword kind of reminds me of, uh, of my first piece. So I hope it finds a great home for someone out there. Uh, wishing you all the very best in this holiday season. And I look forward to continuing to serve you uh, into 2016. All right, take care. Bye for now.